thank you very much. I have been awake for a while. I got my 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 uh, conversation and debating skills as well. Uh, I, I thank everyone for coming out this morning. I I won't go through the VIP itself either, but I do thank uh, all the ministers and MLAs who have come out uh, this morning. Thank you for their life. Great to see the types of we're going to be able to build between the provincial government and a conservative government come October of this year. And I do want to acknowledge who are part of the conservative team. I want to acknowledge the candidates that we have nominated for the next election. We have more from Fundy Royal. We have Richard. There's 338 riding. I'll do my best. <laughs> uh, three have been nominated and working very hard. So thank you very much for joining me uh, this morning. So I'll keep my remarks very brief. I was uh, so people ask questions to hear about what the Conservative Party is working on as we unveil our platform going into the next election. And there a huge appetite here in Atlantic Canada for a change in government, uh, even in uh, a first term of a new change. When I uh, visited uh, Moncton earlier, uh, going through a farmer's market here, and uh, I, met, I met a lady who was uh, selling soaps in a stall at the farmer's market, and, uh, and when she introduced herself to me, she said, I just, I'm just very, very sorry. That's, that's apologizing. Oh, I'm so, so sorry. I voted. She was a small business owner and she was affected by the attack the Liberal government was proposing at the time and indeed that they. Well, this is one of those uh, examples. Justin Trudeau was offering. And then was the. Uh, Demonize to create opportunities and create the types of jobs for people in the community. And so this was a woman who was ready to switch the vote or perhaps to Canada. The and, and failed to understand where, and I got so passionate during the small business tax hikes because I got my start thanks to small businesses. Uh, my parents left their contribution to my and they bought me a bus here as well. Uh, paid my own tuition to engage in. So I got a job at a with benefited from the owner to the business owner that took the risk, perhaps mortgaged his house to start one day. Uh, I got investment. And as that business did well, I did I, I, I succeeded with it. When I moved to Saskatchewan, following my wife from Ottawa to Regina, she's from Regina originally, I got a job in an insurance office. I had no experience in the insurance industry, but they paid for my training. They got Opportunity was created by someone else's investment. I benefited with that. And the small business tax hikes the Liberals brought in really separate, in a lot of people's minds, the mutual benefits that Canadians achieve when all sectors of the economy do well. When small and medium sized businesses are allowed to succeed and there is a return on that risk, everybody benefits the, the, the worker, the, 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 the part time employee, the consumer. Everybody benefits when that economy does well. And so the fundamental difference between liberals and conservatives when it comes to we understand the economy is that success breeds success and prosperity is contagious. And you don't need to tear somebody down in order to lift somebody else up. 
And that can all happen uh, hand in hand when we create the conditions for economic growth. That is the best way to uh, improve the lives of Canadians and lift people from one income bracket up to the Atlantic Canada, we have a lot to fight against. We're fighting against the carbon tax. We're fighting against the carbon tax because <clears throat> it is not an environmental plan. It is a tax plan. It's going to make the cost of living See that investment companies decide not to expand. They are setting up shop in other countries, and sometimes in other countries don't have. When we chase away jobs and investment, and we see those uh, factories places of business pop up in other countries and global emissions actually go up. So we're fighting against the carbon tax to protect jobs and uh, keep the opportunities coming in Atlantic Canada. But we are fighting for things as well. And one of the things we are fighting for, what we're championing, is a west to east pipeline that would bring western Canadian energy to eastern markets, eastern refineries. That would be something uh, that, that would fit Atlantic, specifically New Brunswick greatly. And I want to thank my provincial parts in the newly elected uh, PC government for being another voice, another champion of the pipeline. I believe Canada should be self-sufficient when it comes to energy. I'd rather see motorists in Atlanta up their cars with gas from Canadian oil and walking after tanker foreign oil coming into our into human rights and uh, and as well. So those are some of the things I've been talking about throughout my time in Atlantic Canada. We're going to be unveiling more of our policies. Uh, we've uh, we already started having conversations with uh, the provincial government as to what the federal government can do to, to help protect and sustain the fishing industry, the salmon uh, here in New, New Brunswick being a huge uh, issue as it is in many parts of, of, of Canada as well. But always with a view towards ensuring that we're making life more affordable for Canadians. And that is going to be a theme between now and the next election. And more and more families are finding it very, very difficult to get ahead. Uh, of Canadian families are only two hundred dollars away to the end. And when they see uh, taxes go up here, when they see payroll taxes go up there, when they see new costs related to the carbon tax, Minister, uh, uh, who says in the House of Commons that low-income people, low-income people, don't benefit from tax breaks because they don't pay taxes. Uh, there's a great sense of frustration that. This Prime Minister just doesn't get it, doesn't get the day-to-day -day struggles that the vast majority of Canadian families are facing. So a Conservative plan come October will be to ensure that we have the climate for economic success, where businesses can grow for the sake of the business owners, not just for the 1.2 million uh, small business, small medium-sized businesses in Canada, not just for the sake of, of corporations with head offices in big cities, but for the millions and millions of Canadians whose jobs depend on that growth and on that investment coming to Canada. And we'll also have a, a, a variety of programs aimed at making life more affordable so that you can get ahead and not just get by. And everywhere I hear that theme that people are tired of paying mistakes. The billions and billions of dollars that add up with this inability to balance the budget but the inability to secure our borders and all the costs of illegal border crossing. Uh, I know the real appetite for change in this country, and come October, Conservatives will deliver that change and help Canadian families. Bye. Thank you very much for your time, and I'm happy to take your questions now. So I'd like to ask a question, but about making form, or are you able to talk to me? Well, uh, thank you very much. And as a, as a patron of the arts, I want to thank you. And uh, I'm not ready to unveil our platform with specific that conservatives have always uh, to to the arts, there's a to uh, 
uh, to, to support for national institutions the National Arts Center and some of the various uh, national groups of everything from theater to ballet to music. Um, we did uh, facilitate private sector contributions to the arts by, uh, by allowing uh, greater tax incentives for charitable contributions, especially where, uh, where it comes to, um, uh, to, uh, to setting up endowment funds or, or grants. Uh, I, we, we had a, a little theater in, in Ottawa, theater that subscriber to and we would often uh, to some of the different plays uh, so it is uh, it is a huge part of our uh, we, yes we conservatives talk a lot about economics and job growth and prosperity uh, but society is more than just that it's more than just economic data uh, and I can commit to you that the federal government under conservative uh, be that, uh, that that partner with the arts as well Mr. Shear, uh, again, welcome to Fredericton. Uh, question for you, just because it's so topical right now with the cold temperature outside, mm -hmm. and uh, municipalities and provinces are dealing with the social. Um, been released by the current government. Uh, we're waiting for some money to flow through. Mm -hmm. uh, just wonder what uh, your party's commitment is to um, bringing in uh, housing first or money to get to, to help people get off the streets and. As you know, the housing strategy, it, there's not a lot of dollars flowing today. It's, it was a big item. Uh, a lot of it was unfunded. It was uh, aspirational agreement with provinces uh, with, as I said, the start date uh, coming much further down the line. Um, there are lots of issues around affordable housing in Canada. There's I think, kind of two pieces there. One is social housing. One is housing for people who, who are, are unemployed or struggling. Be homeowners. A lot of that uh, from addiction to mental health. Uh, so that, of course, the the, the federal government will uh, continue to play a role with the provinces. Uh, we also need to look at affordable housing side of that, and not just affordable housing in the sense of and. and Here's some infrastructure for can we work approvals the price unit isn't uh, made up of percent of compliance costs and regulatory pieces of our our solution as well to, to work in a constructive way. to help with uh, housing affordability as well. If we only demand side, if we only talk about helping people save and and five dollars chasing the same number of units and continue to rise. So we do have a supply side part of the conversation as well. And that can include greater densification. It can you know we, we can talk about uh, you know the different types of uh, models that are out there. Uh, start so we don't, we'll still be dealing with the same problem in the, in the years to come. I have a question back here, but before you can I <laughs> here I'm back here starting of the ways there. <laughs> Good morning. Um, I Welcomed uh, the contributions of, of everyone. We, under the previous Conservative government, we had the highest levels of sustained immigration in, in, in generations. For us is making sure that the the target for what Canada hopes to achieve in terms of immigration is directly linked to our needs. We're basing it on our economic and demographic of 
have uh, we have a need for immigration to keep our economy growing. We also have a need for immigration to keep our population. Uh, here in New Brunswick, even though there are some parts of Atlantic Canada with uh, with higher unemployment rates, uh, there are still job shortages, uh, sh worker shortages. There are jobs going unfilled, and immigration is definitely part of that. So I've had a conversation with some of my provincial counterparts about the pilot that uh, was launched to help uh, different to fill that. Um, so you, you, you'll, you're going to see in the next election what, what I would call a bit of an auction between you know both sides of the debate. Liberals in the you know uh, we more and more. And I believe we should have a balanced approach. It shouldn't should be a political debate about how many what, what the right numbers. It should be a, a simple formula. You know what we need as a country for economic and population growth with an appropriate. <coughs> Uh, blend of compassion, humanitarian grounds. So uh, there will be a part of our stream that speaks to family reunification. Uh, there can be many benefits uh, that come along with that, as well as Canada's traditional role as being uh, one of the countries that does welcome refugees who are fleeing persecution and, and strife. But all of that, all based on a system that has integrity. And where we need to ensure that Canadians continue to have confidence in our immigration system is fixing the issue at the border. That is fueling a lot of the debate, the concern, a lot of the anxiety that is being expressed about our immigration system stems from the fact that for two years now, this Liberal government has done absolutely nothing to stop. And that's having an effect on every type of immigrant. More and more resources are going to process, uh, process claims from people who are crossing in illegally from upstate New York. That means further come to Canada the right way. And I've met people who have spent seven years in a refugee camp. Seven years in a refugee camp. They would be killed if they had have left their brother or their sister who's still in that camp. And they see someone get on a flight to JFK, get on a bus, cross into Canada legally, and they're at the front of the line. And that's not fair, it's not compassionate to those facing real persecution. So a conservative government would make our immigration system fair, orderly, and compassionate. Hi, uh, Jane Ryan with the New Brunswick Real Estate Association. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, our National Association has talked about the uh, stress test regarding mortgages and the fact that real estate, as you know, is local. Uh, the national policy that is impacting certainly the Toronto and uh, Vancouver market certainly seems to have its intended effect, but it's applied across the country. So far, stats from our National Association indicate that 100,000 uh, people have been impacted by that test and not having their dream home or home that they want to purchase. So I'd like to know what your local, what your policy might be on the application of such a stress test. Should it be a national policy or should it be identified as something depending on the market itself? Well, uh, I, I, I believe as we, as we go forward and look at different housing policies, we have to change the way we look at the housing market in Canada. There is not a national housing market in this country. Uh, there are many different housing markets. The, the challenges that are facing Toronto and Vancouver are not the same challenges that you're facing here in Fredericton and in Atlantic Canada. Certainly not. That. Even in my own province of Saskatchewan, the market between Regina and Fort Capella is much different. The market between Regina and Saskatoon can be much different. We have other programs in Canada where we take into account regional differences. And to paint an entire country with one broad brush and to say because of an overheated market in two or three or even four specific centers, the entire country now uh, is going to have to be under the same policies. I believe that's a mistake. So bringing in more regional variations in terms of housing policies, I believe, is a, an essential first step. Uh, on the stress test itself, we're seeing a lot of the, the data coming in where it's having unintended consequences, specifically around the uh, qualification for the two points higher. On a 2% mortgage, being able to qualify for a 4% mortgage is 100% <coughs> different. On a 5% mortgage, a 2% is not 100% increase. So, you know, some looking at some kind of flexibility as to, as interest rates continue to rise, as they, as they likely will, I don't know, but the indications are. Uh, having some greater types of flexibility on that or, or uh, a sliding scale, some of the things that we're looking at. 
um, in addition, some things about first-time home, home buyers uh, having you know, a different regime than uh, you know, people who have been in the market for a while that would have more equity in their, in their home. So looking at the different types of home buyers and the different challenges, the different situations for people who are looking to buy a home, whether you're looking to buy your, your first home, you've got a different set than if you're moving up, upscaling or downscaling uh, later on in life. So personal flexibility as well as regional flexibility and their variations are going to be part of the our approach to uh, the housing market. Good morning. Whoa. Hey. Uh, my name is Anthony Knight. I work for the New Brunswick Medical Society. We represent the province as physicians. Uh, in New Brunswick, we have one of the oldest populations in Canada in terms of health status. We have uh, patients with a number of comorbidities, and healthcare is a real concern for New Brunswick. Uh, I'd be interested uh, what your vision is for a, a national strategy for healthcare in Canada. Uh, we know that the previous Conservative government took less of a national view on healthcare and was much more interested in letting provinces figure it out on their own with funding strings attached. But what's your national vision to ensure that all Canadians have access to healthcare in Canada? Well, uh, I, we are, as Conservatives, we do believe in, in respecting jurisdictions and we uh, you know we see a lot of the, the downsides of a one-size-fits-all approach uh, where with a bit of an auto and knows best attitude we've got uh, different provinces looking to innovate in different ways for me the key is stable funding stable bankable funding that provincial governments can see for the long term will be their source of revenue their share of the federal commitment and then allow them to, to plan accordingly and, uh, and to innovate to try different things in Saskatchewan the Delivery of MRIs was uh, was changed, and uh, the DARB private sector delivery uh, of uh, MRI diagnostics. The, the benefit for that was that the, the facilities that were uh, providing that service also had, also took them off the list as well. And so the wait list for pi for public delivery went down uh, because we let the government leverage the, the greater capacity in that sector. That's an approach that Saskatchewan was was, was willing to try. It's, 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 a, it's an approach that other provincial governments may not want to. Uh, others may want to do other things. So allowing that, that, that the innovation to come from provincial governments, I believe is essential because there may be models that one province tries that, want, that other provinces want to replicate or emulate. Um, to, to me, to, to have that, 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 uh, that approach from Ottawa saying we're going to run these things for the provinces, I don't believe ends up with better results. Where the government can, where the federal government can play a leadership role in the things like national, national uh, strategies is ensuring that there are you know, basic levels of service. Uh, there are things we can do in terms of bulk pur purchases of pharmaceuticals, take advantage of the, 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 the leveraging power of the federal government to uh, achieve that, uh, to, uh, to, to be the leading uh, driver in terms of research and innovation so that a lot of that can happen with the federal government backing it and promoting it. A lot of provincial governments, especially in New Brunswick uh, or Atlantic Canada, where you are facing an, an aging population, you're going to have different priorities. Research may not be as big a piece of the, of the overall pie chart because you've got delivery challenges for an aging population. So where the federal government can upload some of those uh, aspects of the, fe of the health system to allow provinces to be there to ensure that the delivery and the care and the quality of frontline health care services, that's where I think the federal government can play uh, a very important role. Good morning, Mr. Shear. Uh, James Landrigan with Royal Bank. Uh, question for you on energy. Uh, you mentioned earlier about pipelines. Uh, I wonder if you can expand a little bit more on your vision for pipelines and if we can expect to see revived discussions about uh, bringing a pipeline through to Atlantic Canada. Right. Uh, well, uh, in general, I, I should say this. So, it's only recently that we talk, that we've been having a conversation about how governments get pipelines built, uh, and to me that is an indictment of the current liberal policy when it comes to energy. Because prior to that, the private sector built pipelines, and investors and companies who are willing to take their their shareholders' money and 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 build them, that's what built pipe pipelines in this country. The, the the government's role was in setting the conditions and ensuring that the approvals process was transparent, rigorous, uh, and and fair and 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 had adequate, not just adequate, adequate, but dynamic and robust consultations on the First Nations file. Now, in 2019, we're in a situation where, because of over-regulation, because of things 
things like Bill C-69 because of the, uh, the, the outright cancellation of Northern Gateway and the Energy East pipelines where the Liberal government vetoed that, that now we're down to one, the Trans Mountain. And the only way that this government saw to, uh, to proceed with that was to buy it with your tax dollars. And it turns out they overpaid for it. They spent about a billion dollars more than what it was worth, which I've never been able to understand. When you've got a company that's trying to leave Canada and abandon a project, how we overpaid for that is uh, is behind me. You know, it's a, it wasn't the negotiator. You know, he was pretending to be during uh, the negotiations with Tom. Uh, energy out to other countries. It's extracted the highest environmental standards with, with best labor practices where, with Canadians benefiting from that. So we are going to uh, cancel C-69. We're going to repeal it. Well, that's currently going for Everyone in the energy sector tells me the same thing. So you tell us what But you can't keep moving the goalposts on us. You can't keep shifting back another time. That's what's happening with this current government. So our, our constitutional obligations. Private sector will determine it. If there's a business case for a pipeline, Canada close together, linking the benefits of our oil and gas sector in Western Canada with Eastern markets, with the benefits of the jobs and the refineries and the, the energy, the, the value added that comes with that, closer together. That's something that can bring this country closer together. And uh, that's something that absolutely, if, if uh, your willingness is there, I will ensure that the government plays that partnership role in ensuring that there's a path to us so we can finally get a West-East pipeline that displaces helps Canada become self-sufficient when it comes to energy. Uh, Bob Chisholm, local business owner. The internet's created a lot of opportunities, Andrew, but a lot of the products and services sold on the internet into New Brunswick don't pay HST, uh, which makes it hard for the bricks and mortar people that are paying property taxes to compete. Um, I never thought I'd ask a politician about finding a way to tax things. Um, <laughs> But I, I, I think there's a huge amount of money being missed, and I think whether it's Airbnb or Uber, you're creating an unfair competition for people who've invested in, in this country. And I, I think it's a huge opportunity. What, what do you think a conservative government could do to start making sure that taxes are paid on all transactions? Well, uh, I want, let me take this point as as uh, as feedback, as as, uh, as something we, we we are we are of course aware of that. Uh, there th there are advantages to online transactions now, things coming in from foreign uh, markets. Uh, we certainly don't want Canada to be on an un unlevel playing field. We are the party of low taxes and, and as you said, you know, we don't look for ways to, to apply uh, new taxes. Uh, but I, I will just leave with you the, the fact that we are aware of this. We've heard this from many different sectors, both uh, retail and, and Canadian companies that compete online. You know, there are Canadian uh, success stories in the IT field that are headquartered in Canada that uh, sell products products or services online and, and they've they've highlighted this as a, a growing area of, uh, of concern as a huge competitive advantage to, to other countries. So we are looking at what other countries around the world have used as models and we will have uh, we will have something to say on this uh, as we get closer to the election. Thank you. Welcome Mr. Shear. Uh, my question is with regards to the Arctic and uh, the previous Conservative government had a lot of positive energy and momentum in uh, developing the economic opportunities there. Um, that seems to have fallen off the map. Is that something that will reappear in your platform? It will, yes. And I've had many meetings with per, uh, territorial representatives from the north. And the, the sense they have right now is that this the current government views the north as one big giant, giant park. And uh, Justin Trudeau actually made an announcement dedicating a huge swath of territory, the Northwest Territories, as designated as parkland. He didn't 
say that in the Northwest Territories. He didn't say that in Toronto or Ottawa. He said that in New York. And there's a real sense of, you know, to, to satisfy an international environmental community, you just change the lives of thousands of people in northern Canada. And so our vision for the North is to, uh, to, 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 to empower the development. There's a great sense of untapped economic possibility in the north when it comes to natural resources, mining especially, and there are communities there that want to be able to grow and make those investments, but they have a lack of infrastructure, they have lack of access, and then they have a sense that Ottawa doesn't want them to right now under this government because it's it's it's, it's inconvenient for their, their, their overall message. So yes, developing the north, having a real presence there, building the, the, the pathways uh, in, into those areas, facilitating that. Canada, we're, we're competing against so many countries that you can do exploration, you can do drilling, you can do development 12 months of the year. Uh, many parts of Canada, you've got shorter windows for that development, for that exploration. So we need to have uh, an advantage. We need to have uh, uh, incentives or, uh, you know, like, uh, we need to find something to make Canada uh, uh, an exciting place to invest in those, to, to compensate for the natural challenges that exist in doing that in Canada. And a lot of that has to do with regulatory burdens, uh, everything's from, you know, exploration tax credits. The, uh, some of these tax credits get renewed on a three-year basis, and so there's not that sense of uh, permanency that if you're going to make a, a big investment in a place that's hard to get to, you want to know that the government's going to be there for you, for, you know, five, ten years, not just one or two years. So those are the things we're looking at to send the signal to the world that we are committed to development of our northern territories. Folks, we have time for one more question, and I see there's one at the back, so final question. Uh, good morning, Mr. Shear. Mike Legere with the Forest Products Association. Um, uh, I just have a, I mean, obviously New Brunswick is the most forestry dependent province in the country. Uh, we have a lot of constraints here with regards to trade, in particular with tariffs, uh, whether it's on, uh, on pulp products or softwood lumber in particular. Uh, we expect a negotiated settlement on, on the softwood lumber dispute. Uh, would a Conservative government be committed to maintaining New Brunswick's exclusion from those tariffs should that, that negotiated settlement occur? Uh, yeah, so. Uh, Absolutely, we want to uh, to, to settle the, the softwood lumber, and yes, we would. I've had some meetings with the for forestry industry here in New Brunswick, and uh, it's a different regime in New Brunswick. I understand it's uh, it's not the same scenario as in other provinces, and I know that in the past, when there has been a breakdown in the softwood lumber agreement. That These decisions should be based on real numbers and real facts. It was very disappointing that we saw our government sign a deal that did not include an end to steel and aluminum tariffs and did not settle the softwood lumber dispute. We were expecting that after, you know, when I, I got a phone call from Mr. Trudeau to tell me what the major points in the deal, uh, everything that was listed were concessions. You know, uh, we, the, we gave up uh, sovereignty on uh, our pharmaceutical regime. We uh, we gave, signed on to huge concessions on dairy, accepted a cap in the auto sector. Uh, and so I said, well, what did we get in return? You know, are steel and aluminum tariffs resolved? No, they're not. Okay, softwood lumber? No, they're not. Uh, we've got nothing back in return. So we've been able to do this in the past. Conservative governments have been able to, without reopening the entire NAFTA agreement, because we can all agree that that's a, a very p big piece for our entire economy. But we can and we have in the past negotiated side deals on these irritants like the softwood lumber agreement. So that will be a, a huge priority for our trade agenda, for our foreign uh, policy agenda in dealing with the United States is to once and for all get a deal on softwood lumber to get that uh, sense of st stability back in the region. Thank you very much. Thanks very much everyone. It's been very, very enjoyable to answer your questions this morning.